The Gospel of Mark tells us, as Jesus was setting out on his journey to Jerusalem, a man came and knelt before him and said, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus looked at him and said, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. Do not kill, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. And the man said, all these I have done from my youth. <laughs> and Jesus looked at him and loved him and said, you lack one thing. Go and sell everything that you have and give the money to the poor. Then you will have riches in heaven. Then you can follow me. And at this saying, the man's countenance fell. And he went away sorrowful, for he was a man of rich possessions. And Jesus said to the disciples, how hard it is for rich people to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich person to enter the kingdom. And the disciples were all exceedingly astonished. <laughs> and they said, who then can be saved? And Jesus said, with people, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. The words of Scripture. Thanks be to God. And thank you for sitting through and listening to that very difficult text. This is not one of our favorites. It's not one that we embroider and hang on the wall, right? When your pastor, Pastor Wes, asked me to come and preach today, he didn't tell me why he needed someone here. Then I read the lectionary. I don't want to preach on this stuff either. <laughs> Here's Job, the, the world's greatest whiner. Oh, God, if only you understood what I'm going through, as if God doesn't know. Oh, God, I could tell you a thing or two. Have you ever felt like that? I feel like that every time some company gets me upset and I call their customer service hotline, right? Please, we appreciate your call. It is very important to us. Please continue holding for the next customer service representative. Oh, I could tell these people a thing or two. This is customer service? I don't think so. And then there's this passage from Mark which is so hard for us to hear. We modern-day Americans, our whole culture is built on consuming, on buying and selling. We earn the money, then we spend it, right? That's how our culture is built. And we don't really want to hear this at all. You're not going to like this sermon, okay? I can tell you that right now because I don't like it myself. There are two things I'd like to say about this passage. The first is that Jesus is talking to us here. Let's not try to weasel out of it. He's talking to those other people, those rich people. Or, well, I happen to have a lot of stuff, but it's not like I'm in love with it or anything. Uh, no, let's not try to weasel out of it. Jesus is talking to us. And this is where it's a disadvantage to have somebody talking about this who's lived in the majority world, in the poor southern part of the world. Let's think about the whole world. Seven billion people split it into three pieces. Rich folks, poor folks, and the middle folks in the middle, all right? So where do we fit? Let's think about our houses. Think about the walls in your houses. Do you have anything on your walls for decoration? Pictures? Photos, wall hangings, shelves full of little items. If you have stuff on your walls for decorations, like I do, you're rich. 
If you don't have any decorations, and the stuff on your walls are the tools of your trade, an ax, a fishing net, pots and pans that you need to cook, then you're middle class. The poor don't have walls. You think about food, same sort of thing. How many of us have enough food in our houses right now to feed ourselves and our families tomorrow? I do. I'm rich. How many of you don't have enough food to feed yourselves and your family tomorrow, but you're pretty confident you could find it or grind it or buy it at the market? If so, you're middle class. For the poor, forget about tomorrow. They're wondering what they're going to eat today. We can't weasel out of this. We're rich, okay? Hey, I've got a house that will heat me when I'm cold and cool me when I'm hot, and I've got hot and cold running water and a flush toilet. I'm richer than Pilate or Herod, all right? The second thing I'd like to point out about this passage is this is not just Jesus having a bad day, okay? It's not like he forgot what he really wanted to say or somebody dropped the cue cards. This is a consistent theme through the gospel. Treat your neighbor as yourself. If you got two coats, give one away. Do not lay up treasures for yourself on earth. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. We can't just cut this passage out of the Bible and wad it up and stuff it in our pocket and pretend it isn't there. It's there. So what do we do? Do we go away sorrowful like the man in the story because we have great possessions? No, don't give up too fast. He missed the best part. The disciples said, okay, then how can anybody be saved, Jesus? And Jesus replied, with people it's impossible, but with God all things are possible. The man missed the message. The message is, if we're left to ourselves, we see no way out of this, folks, right? Because we're attached to our possessions and we're fearful about getting rid of them. But Jesus says that the gospel is about changing lives beyond anything we can expect, beyond all expectations. So we start struggling with this difficult story and making choices and figuring out how to de-accumulate and how to become more giving in a world that tells us all the time, get, get, get. Just coming here, taking a little time out of our busy, 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 busy lives, this is countercultural. You're rebellious just to be here this morning. You're taking a Sabbath. That's cool. (laughs) To take a little bit of money and offer it up to give back to the God that has given us so much, You're in rebellion against the American dream. Good for you. God can change our expectations, can change our understandings of society, and we can take those small steps that help us start on accompanying Jesus on his journey as he sets out toward Jerusalem. And that's the end of the sermon. We have a little bit of time left. Let me tell you a story from in the South Pacific, okay? My wife, Laura, and I worked as missionaries, or mission co-workers, we call them, in the little island country of Vanuatu. Vanuatu is a set of 80 inhabited islands that spread out in the South Pacific Ocean, about this far from Australia. It's just a bunch of volcanoes sticking out of the ocean. And we worked there as teachers and teacher mentors and teacher trainers and developed kindergartens and all that kind of stuff. But the story I want to tell you today is about a general assembly that we visited. The Presbyterian Church of Vanuatu holds general assemblies every year on different islands. 
every year. It's a big honor to host General Assembly. Some years back, General Assembly was hosted by the tiny little island of Makira. Now, Makira is only about three miles long. It's surrounded by cliffs on three sides. There's only one beach where boats can come ashore. There's no landing strip. There's no electricity. There's no phones. There's only one village of about 400 people. And these folks are hosting General Assembly, where about 600 visitors from around the country will come visit for a week. And so they did what Presbyterians everywhere do. They appointed committees. <laughs> there was a committee on the neighboring island of Epi, and it was their job to butcher a cow on Tuesday and cut it up and put the pieces in a canoe and bring over the extra food for Tuesday dinner. And there was a committee on the neighboring island of Matasso. They started a full year in advance planting extra root crops, yams and manioc and taro, and then harvested it and piled it into canoes and brought it over on Wednesday so we could feed all these visitors that more than doubled the population of the island for General Assembly. We landed, that is my wife and my two teenage daughters and I, landed on the island of Makira where we were greeted as honored guests because we were representing you, their brothers and sisters in the United States from the Presbyterian Church USA. We were given the most luxurious place to stay on the island. The chief moved out of his house and we got to move in which means we had a gravel floor and woven bamboo walls and a thatched roof. So at night, we would roll out our leaves, our, our mats made out of woven leaves, about that thick, on the gravel floor. And we would lie there and listen to the rats run back and forth in the thatch over our heads. And they would drop little gifts on us. And during the day, the village children would come up to the the walls of the house and peek through. They were so curious about us. I think they wanted to see if we were white all over. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it was a wonderful week, though. We met people from all over the country and learned lots of hymns and worshiped and prayed every day and listened to all the discussions that went on, like at our general assemblies. Some of the issues are very familiar. How do we keep our youth involved? How do we train Sunday school teachers better? Things like that. Some of them were very strange, at least to an American. One of the issues that year was, should we keep the traditional pig killing ceremony as part of laying the cornerstone of a new church? Is that an appropriate acculturation like Christmas trees for North Americans? Or is that denying Christ as the sufficient sacrifice for all? You know, theological discussions in the South Pacific. We had a wonderful week. Everything went like clockwork. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, until Thursday. The wind switched direction. It wasn't a hurricane or anything. The wind just changed direction and piled up a heavy surf on this one beach. And it was very clear that no boats were coming ashore until the wind changed. So we had no food deliveries on Thursday or Friday or Saturday. The surf just kept pounding on the island. And by Saturday night, our dinner was a little plate with a lump of yam about half the size of my fist with a little bit of broth on top of it. And in a situation like that, you start looking at your neighbor's plates. <laughs> How much did you get? <laughs> and we were the honored guests. I'm sure they were giving us more than our fair share. What about those skinny little kids who were sneaking up and peeking at us? What were they eating? What about the moms or the expectant moms? Were they getting enough? I don't know. We start worrying. We start fretting. We went to bed hungry that night. And then Sunday morning, we all met in the church for our farewell worship service at the end of General Assembly. And it was very clear no boats were leaving this island either. We were stuck there. And we spent Sunday being fearful 
and worried and hungry. And we went to bed that night listening to the surf pound on the island and we were overdue. We should have been home by now. We woke up Monday morning to the sound of the surf on the island and then we heard the sound of the shell calling us together. We crowded into the village church, as many of us could fit there, and all the villagers around the outside. Nobody knew what would happen. The moderator of the Presbyterian Church of Vanuatu stood up in front of everybody. Nobody knew what he was going to say. And he raised his hands like this, and he declared a day of fasting. <laughs> what could he do? We were out of food. <laughs> <coughs> but we all laughed just like you did and we relaxed and we passed the time singing hymns and praying and singing hymns and reading scripture and singing hymns and then when people started giving impromptu sermons and testimonies we got tired of that and somebody found an old volleyball or sorry an old soccer ball and we decided to use it like a volleyball and we went down to the beach and we hung up a rope for a net and we scratched lines in the sand and then we played volleyball impromptu teams all these these old white-haired elders and pastors out there playing volleyball against the village teenagers or against island against island all these teams playing each other we had a delightful time and we went to bed that night tired and hungry with sand in our hair from the beach but relaxed and happy. Somehow, when we gave away our greed and we gave away our fear, it all went to God together. <coughs> God knew we needed food, and God knew we were afraid. And God took the need and the greed and the fear away. We awoke the next morning to absolute silence, like the first day of creation. And we went down to the beach, and the South Pacific was as flat as a farmer's pond. And the sun was rising out of the ocean, and it looked like there was a golden pathway from us straight to the heart of the universe. And in that brilliant light, there were tiny little specks, the silhouettes of boats coming from the other islands. We had not been forgotten. They knew we were in trouble. They were coming to bring food to the island, and they were coming to take us home. I share that story with you because it's about fasting. It's about doing without. It's about liberation from greed, which is a story we don't hear in the United States, something we can learn from partnerships overseas, perhaps, something about how God can change lives beyond our expectations. Let me tell you another story from a strange, exotic place, okay? This one's called the United States. After two years in the South Pacific, my family landed in Montana, and the kids hugged their grandparents, and we slept at my folks' house that night. And the next morning, I needed to borrow my dad's car to go to the store to buy some, suit, to buy some toothpaste. And so he said I could borrow the car as long as I filled it with gas. Some things never change. So I drove across town, and I came to the store. And I went inside, and there was the pharmacy. And then I came to the toothpaste aisle. Now remember, I've been two years on this tiny little island in the South Pacific, and when we bought toothpaste, we bought it from the students' cooperative store that was about the size of this piano. And they, when they had toothpaste, they only had one size, little tubes about that big, student size, white. But here I was, in the toothpaste aisle. 
Brothers and sisters, have you been to the toothpaste aisle? They have little tubes, but they have medium tubes and big tubes and large tubes and family economy sized multiple tubes wrapped together. And they have with and without whitening and with and without fluoride. And they have white and blue and green and pink striped and sparkly and speckled. And all the packages are brightly wrapped and they say, buy me, buy me. I will make you healthy. I will make you happy. I will make you sexy. Buy me. You can't live without me. And I was just overwhelmed in the toothpaste aisle. So I just reached out and I grabbed a box and I paid for it and when I got it home I looked at it and I had bought a box of denture adhesive. <laughs> you live in an overwhelming society, have you noticed? You live in a strange exotic culture. We grab onto things so tightly and we think they will make us happy and we hoard them like dragons on a hoard in the old stories. Maybe if we practiced releasing them, our hands would be open enough we could do a better job of reaching out to our neighbors and a better job of praying. Will you pray with me? Dear God, we thank you that you invite us away from the idolatries of our culture. Help us recognize them. Help us recognize our own addictions. Help us take the first small steps to join you on your path your road to Jerusalem and the cross. Help us experience the freedom that comes by following you and your example. And this we pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who is for us the golden pathway straight to the heart of the universe. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.